Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here and checking out the series. Of course, you know what to do. If you uh, if you like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists. And I am so excited because they are if not my all-time favorite band, then definitely my all-time favorite band. Mike Mills of REM back. Hello, sir. Hello there. Uh, man, three a week. That's that's hard work. Yeah, it's, you know, and all, all the rest of them are just me biding my time to get back around to when you guys have another anniversary coming up so I can do another REM interview. So Thank you. <laughs> this time, we get to talk about a little record called Up. Came out in 1998. It is my favorite REM record. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. And um, now, now whether it's the best REM record, I think that's a different thing, you know, whatever that means, but it's my favorite. It's the one that means the most to me. It's um, it's an album that doesn't get talked about enough. And then probably an album that when it does get talked about, I always feel gets is a misunderstood record. And, uh, and I don't know, you know, we, we, so there's a new deluxe edition. It's got this great live album that goes along with it from the, uh, the party of five uh, show, but uh, but just kind of going back there before I get too deep in it, you know, I I don't want to project too much. So I just want to kind of open it up to you. 25 years later, for all this record was, what does it mean to you? Um, well, it's really. It's kind of a powerful record in, in terms of memory, because it was made under such difficult circumstances. Um, you know, the story's told and known that that Bill had left the band and. Uh, you know, we were already leaning towards making a more electronic machine driven record. Uh, obviously, Bill's leaving accelerated that process. But, um, you know, it was a record. Most bands would have been smart and taken a little time off and, you know, regathered themselves and and determined how they were feeling after losing a member. But uh, we, we were a stubborn bunch. And we said, you know, we've already started this record. We got demos. We got songs we like. Let's just do it. Um uh, and so we we made a, a really remarkable record under remarkably difficult circumstances, especially considering that what we decided to do was throw out all the rules that we had. Any any previous guidelines or restrictions that we put on ourselves all went out the window. Uh, so it was liberating in that sense, but it was also terrifying in the sense that we didn't have any anything to really fall back on. It was just uh, we, it was kind of like a high wire without a net. So. I'm really proud of it. And and I thought that because of that, because there were so few bedrock foundations to stand on, it, it became even more interesting because it's so different than anything we did before. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's what stood out to me. I mean, uh, you know, because of my age, I mean, I, I remember coming around with automatic and, and monster meaning a lot that opened a lot of doors for me and, and new adventures was great too. And we got to talk about that last time. When this hit, there was something in the air. There was something in the air that people were doing. Radiohead was doing it a little bit, you know, and some other bands with electronics. You guys did it in a very different way because there was this very organic sound to these these electronics. In fact, when I listen to it now, what really stands out to me is this 60s vibe. And I was thinking... Um, you know, when you have the younger generations come around and they're like, oh, we're discovering our own 90s. I always think that they forget about that there was this version of the 90s where, you know, you all were kind of looking back at the 60s. Like there's a little go-go in there every now and then, you know, there's uh, there's some of that stuff. Like where did that, I mean, it may have just been the stuff you grew up on, but did, were, were, did you know that sound was there when you were doing it? You know, we didn't know what was there when we were doing it. We were just winging it. Um, but but I will say this. One thing about, about that record and about R.E.M. songs in general, there is usually one guy with a guitar or one guy with a piano at the core of most of them. So even though these songs are very, you know, electrified or mechanized or however you wish to, to describe it, there's still a real organic song at the core of almost all of it and that makes a difference it's not like we just started making noises with machines and and you know came out with with these series of sounds they are real songs underneath all of that so uh, i think that that makes a difference and gives it a, a stability what little stability it has comes from that uh and and the organic what organic feel it has also comes from the fact that there there is a song uh, a really basic simple song underneath all of it yeah now, does that go for the same with Airport Man? Because what a flex that was. <laughs> no, Airport Man is is uh, is is 
I, I don't know what airport man is. It's kind of a, it's like a dream sequence to me. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's like a, a person in a daze. It's, it's like when you've been through too many airports, you know, and you're wandering through this airport and you're like, which airport am I in? Why am I here? Where am I going? Where have I been? I don't know any of these things. So, um, you know, and, and, it, and it's such an odd song for REM. And we were in such a weird contrarian mood with everything we'd been through at that point. I said, why don't we just start the record with the weirdest song we've ever made? And, and our feeling was, okay, here's the new REM. This is not like the old REM. If you can, if you can appreciate this song, then you'll really like everything else. You know, it's kind of like, welcome to the new world. Here's the gateway through which you have to pass to get to it. And, uh, and, and so we put it up there first, just to let people know kind of what was coming. Yeah, we got to talk about it in our last interview with you and with you and Michael. Um, but that's a song I, I frequently hum. I find it so comforting to hum that song, which is about all you can do with a song like that, too, is just kind of hum along. <laughs> you know, it, it is oddly soothing in a way, except for the weird, bah, 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 the weird noise that comes in there. But but otherwise, it's it's dreamy, which mm. is which I kind of dig about it. I, I feel like the other side of that in, in in the context that we're talking is Day Sleeper, which ends up being the first hit, which I find one of the most magical songs that I love to listen to. Like, you know, some songs have magic in it. But when you talk about what you're talking in that it's dreamy and then you have a song called Day Sleeper, you know, I mean, and the airports and then you have that video of, of you know, the offices and all that, like, like, it seems like if you can define it at all, that might be one of those things you look back on because usually when you, you write a song and, and maybe a little bit falls on Stipe's shoulders because he's putting the lyrics to it, but but you don't know what you're writing about until much later. And then you go, oh, look, there was a theme. There was something right. happening there. Right, you know, right. Does yeah, that, that serve true for that? Well, for that song, you know, I don't know. I think when when we write the music, we usually have no idea what Michael's going to do with it. So, you know, there are a lot of songs we wrote that I thought would be these like supremely pop things that turned out to be not pop at all. And yet we're probably better songs for it. Um, and, and that's fine. You know, that's that's that was a lot of fun for us was to write a song and give it to Michael and have no idea what, if anything, he would come back with. Uh, I think Day Sleeper holds together really well because it was one of the first songs that we recorded uh, before things started getting really weird in terms of, of you know, the balance of the band and, 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 and recording schedules and, and, you know, who shows up early, who shows up late, that kind of thing. And, and that's when it all got a little crazy, which I think leads to a lot of the, the craziness on the record, which is all fine. But Airport Man, I mean, excuse me, Day Sleeper is a little more cohesive simply because we, we hadn't fragmented uh, at that point that like we happened to later. Yeah. Was one of those other instances you were talking about not knowing, you know, thinking it was going to be one thing and it was the other, uh, was the sad professor fall into that? Because when I go back and I was watching the documentary um, This Way Up or something, whatever it's called, um, and uh, and there you are, and you're playing the guitar, and, and you guys are writing it, and then Michael says he writes what ends up being the saddest song that he's ever written. It's, uh... <laughs> um, I thought there was a sad sweetness to it when I wrote it, um, and, I, and I thought Michael would pick up on that. I mean... You know, like I said, he he can take songs in different directions, but I don't know where you're going to take that other than to sort of be kind of sad and sweet. Uh, there's just there's only so many places you can go with that kind of song. Uh, I love it. It's it's one of my favorite songs that we ever did, really. I I think, uh, you know, Michael broke talking about breaking the rules. Well, Michael broke one of the main ones, which is that you don't break up sentences over. You just don't break them up like he did. It's very disjointed which is kind of like maybe the thinking of a, of an alcoholic professor might be. Um, but you really sort of have to pay attention to it to find out which words are connected and which ones aren't. So, uh, you know, it, I, I just think it's a beautiful song and it's really sad, but I, I really like it. Yeah. While we're talking about songs, um, the one I probably hit the most is Hope. I don't know why I'm drawn to that song. I know there was a little melody line there with, uh, with Leonard Cohen and maybe that's why, but uh but that's the one I've always wanted to add in, in just the general term of what we're talking about. Like, where did that song come from? Because again, this is a complete electronic thing that's happening here. You know, I was trying to remember what the genesis of that song was the other day. And I, I, I'm not sure I know. I'm, I'm sure Peter had something to do with it because, uh, you know, anything that I didn't come up with most of the time, it was Peter. So, uh, but I don't remember what that was before it turned into what it is, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, it was always going to be some, it's a, it's a Pat McCarthy song as much as anything else. Uh, it was always going to be a very heavily 
uh, electronified uh, and mechanized song. Um, and so we really, in a big way, turned that one over to Pat. Uh, so a lot of what you hear that isn't Michael is is Pat McCarthy. Mm -hmm. It's a cool track. And those, and, and you know, I, I could keep going on there too, because, you know, Lotus being one of those, it's kind of like that, you know, just bizarre, cool stuff that's happening. But, but then, you know, okay, fast forward 25 years and, uh, and we get this box. And I was thinking about the way you guys have been doing these deluxe editions, because a lot of times they collect B-sides, live cuts and everything. This one doesn't quite seem like it. Like there are songs uh, what did I write there? The emphysema and and surfing the ganges. How do you say it? Ganges. 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 Like those aren't part of it. Like when you all talk about doing these these deluxe editions, I think for the fans, we're like, oh, what's going to be on here that we haven't heard? This one doesn't exactly get that. What was the conversation about this one? Um, I'll be honest with you. I, it wasn't my idea. Uh, I like putting the demos on there, but it seemed like this was such a departure record for us. Uh, that just continuing to put out demos and outtakes and things, it just seemed a little out of character with this record. Uh, this record, because we had thrown out literally every rule we had when we made it, when we when we put it out, you know, we printed the lyrics. We did, we just we just said there are no rules. So the other rules we broke were well, we're not gonna we're not gonna fill it up with outtakes and demos. We're gonna give something completely different to maybe our most different records so we put the and also it's just in the in, in keeping with the bizarre nature of it it's us on party of five i mean there's not too much weirder than that uh so so we just added the live show and and also there's an odd juxtaposition of putting a live show with with our least live record um you know it gives maybe it gives it a little humanity a little organic feel that might not have been there if we just put out a bunch of demos right it's nice hearing the live stuff because we didn't we didn't get to experience that in that way at the time not for a little bit later but uh you know those songs like all of our songs like i said there's a song at the core of everything which means that you can somehow reproduce it live one way or another mm -hmm. um are there vault songs in that way i mean you know in another 20 years do we get to turn around and be like okay now we're gonna start releasing all the songs you haven't or like do those even exist oh yeah there's still plenty of stuff lying around but, you know, there's a reason you haven't heard most of it, you know? I mean, I know as a fan, I'm always curious about outtakes and demos and things like that, but uh, you have to decide if it enhances the knowledge of a song or if it diminishes it. Um, and, you know, especially for, for the singers, Michael in particular, but even, even, you know, Bill and I trying to find parts in the background, the, it's, it's like laws and sausages. You don't always want to see how they're made. I don't, you know, that's of course, yeah, right. I know as the artist, that's how you feel. And that's how most artists feel about their work. And then you turn around, the Beatles are like, okay, you get everything. You get everything, everything. You get all the chatter in between, you get everything. And, and we're like, yeah, give us more still. We don't. <laughs> well, you know, they were funny. You know, they, they were, they, they have those accents. Of course you want to hear them talk. Um, I don't think we recorded a lot of chatter. So it's not like we're ever going to have uh the great experience that is the love show in Las Vegas, which I absolutely adore. I've seen it at least twice, if not three times, you know, that's just a, that's a beautiful thing. And I'm so glad they captured all that stuff for us to listen to later. Um, and, and, you know, yes, there are a couple of really cool demos uh, from this record. A suspicion is on this record, right? Mm -hmm. um, Peter's Peter's demo of suspicion is actually better than what's on the record but it's got some things wrong with it that meant we couldn't use it. So, mm. uh, you know, that may see the light of day someday. It, it's even more atmospheric and beautiful than the one on the record, but uh, who knows someday that'll probably find its way out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, just one of those, I mean, their bands, uh, Pearl Jam comes to mind, the lost dogs. It was like, it was it. It was like, let, okay, we're not going to put these on an anniversary edition. We're just going to compile them all onto its own little album. Yeah. I mean, we've done that before we put out eponymous, which was a collection of, lunacy and b-sides and uh you know we don't have a problem doing that uh but uh you know just this just wasn't the time right well in the meantime you've got other folks waving the flag for you uh the mickey dolan's ep and soccer mommy uh also covering you guys on her new ep like this feels like a nice time like there's something it's all coming together for rem at well time. If you last long enough, you can become cool again. You know, the thing is, you first of all, you have to last long enough to become uncool, which we successfully did. 
And then if you continue to, to be in the ether, uh, you'll become a cool again. I, I noticed it when they started. Uh, I, I, I don't watch uh, those, you know, the voice in America's Got Talent. I don't I don't really watch them, but I know that people started covering R.E.M. songs. You know, people were playing Everybody Hurts and, and a few other things. And I said, OK, that's it. We're on the way back. Uh, but, you know, you just got the feel that that we were being rediscovered by a, a, a new generation of people who didn't know the baggage of us becoming uncool, uh, of us, you know, the career, the downward career arc, which happens to everyone. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people weren't familiar with that. We didn't have any baggage. So they said, oh, this is a cool song. I'll sing that. Um, and that's that is kind of nice to see that that having stuck around this long, uh, people are rediscovering our stuff and and. And we're validated in the sense that when we made these records, one of our only overriding uh, ethical ideas was that it be timeless. Mm -hmm. We really didn't want any record to have so much of the sound of the day that it sounded dated when you played it later. In fact, we had a one of our only real problems with IRS was when we made Murmur. And they told, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. They told, uh, they told uh, Mitch and Don to update that snare sound and, and do these other things that made it contemporary early 80s. And Peter and I heard it and said, what the fuck are you doing? This is unacceptable. So we had to go back and remix a lot of it to get that 80s sound out of it. Even now, when I listen to Radio Free Europe, that snare sound bugs me because it's still got too much of that 80s feel. But at, what I, my point is that that you know, because we wanted to make these records timeless, I think that's why they hold up now for people who hadn't heard them 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, it's been fun too. Uh, I, the one thing I didn't mention was, uh, of course, the bear bringing back Strange Currencies, which, you know, fucking amazing song right there. I'm so happy it sort of got its moment in the sun. Did you all see that coming? I mean, that's got to be one of those moments that has to be a, bit, a little bit of a surprise. Well, it was a big surprise. You know, we we've had lots of people asking us to use our songs over the years and we almost always say yes uh what's gratifying about this is that it's such an awesome show it is such a great show it's so well done um and it, the use of our music in it and other people's music is so spot on they those guys really uh know what they're doing and their their love of both their craft and and their art and the music that they apply to that is clear and so that's what makes it work so well. And I'm thrilled that 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 they chose to use our stuff as much as they have and that it's such a great show. I haven't seen season two yet, so uh, but I understand that it's it's even more harrowing than season one, but but also great. You're in for something. You are. And it's renewed for the third season. So hopefully there'll okay. be uh, much more uh, from you guys. Uh, and and that's an easy way to wrap this up by saying what's next. Uh, you were just here in Louisville with the Baseball Project. Great to have you back in town as usual. But uh, what, what happens next for you? Uh, what is next? Uh, I leave tomorrow to head to Spain for a few big star shows. Uh, um, and really, that's it. You know, the concerto thing that I wrote has uh, has several different. You know, we won an Emmy, by the way. I'm going to put that out there. Congratulations. A Night of Georgia Music, which is uh, a part of the uh, it's one of the iterations of the concerto. Um, it's a regional Emmy, but hey, it weighs the same as the other Emmy. So, uh, uh, you know, so we I have a lot of concerto stuff going on, uh, but really it's been a busy year trying to trying to keep next year a little bit more open, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. Mike, it's always such a pleasure to catch up with you. I really do mean that. Uh, 25th anniversary edition of Up. I've waited 25 years to get to this point. So, uh, <laughs> and I am and I can't wait for the anniversary of Reveal next. So that's uh, still on the way. Yeah, that's going to be fun. I'm actually looking forward to that too. Yeah, man. It's great talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. Same to you, Kyle. Thank you. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you. For, uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. 
all three of them. The address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.